this video was supported by an educational grant from Healthmark. Hi, I'm Abby Smart. I'm an epidemiologist and research associate at Ofsted & Associates, a company that specializes in conducting real-world research to support improvements in patient safety and occupational health. And I'm here today to talk about the anatomy of flexible endoscopes. Reusable flexible endoscopes often have visible defects, and guidelines recommend performing visual inspection to make sure that damaged and dirty scopes don't get used on patients. In this video, I'll introduce you to basic endoscope anatomy so that you'll know a little bit about the components of scopes that you might look at when you're doing visual inspection. Endoscopes are used in a lot of different places in the body, and they're customized for different orifices and body cavities including the respiratory system, where they enter the body through the nose and mouth, the urinary and GYN systems, and of course, the GI system. Endoscopes are used for a wide variety of procedures, from screening colonoscopy to taking biopsies and samples for tests needed to see if the patient has an infection or a disease like cancer. They're also commonly used in minimally invasive surgical procedures. Endoscopes are basically long, flexible tubes that have a camera on one end for seeing inside patients and channels for inserting instruments, flushing with water, or purging with air. This is an example of a GI scope, but you'll see the same basic components on a variety of scopes. The light source here plugs into the tower with the monitor and keyboard. It's connected to the scope by the universal cord. The control handle has knobs for controlling the bending section and behind those knobs are valves for suction, air, and water. The biopsy port here allows the endoscopist to insert instruments through the insertion tube, which is the part of the scope that actually goes inside of the patient. Now, this whole thing is actually pretty flexible, but there's a bending section on the end that is designed to be angulated right and left or up and down. And the distal tip has the lens and light sources necessary for seeing inside of patients. So let's take a closer look at a gastroscope control handle, which has control knobs on the side that let the operator move the bending section. And those red and blue circles that you see are for the valves that control air, water, and suction. The red one is where the suction valve goes, and the blue one is where the air water valve goes. There's also an instrument port here, which is used for passing forceps and other instruments down the insertion tube and into the patient. Here's a closer look at the biopsy port of a brand new colonoscope. You can see that the port itself is shiny and metallic, and the base of it is held in place by a black piece called a grommet. And this photo shows an example of a gastroscope boot junction, which is where the control handle attaches to the insertion tube. And this is the bending section of the same scope, which is controlled by those knobs that we saw on the control handle. Now from the outside, you might think that an endoscope is just like a hose with a fancy handle, but there's actually a lot going on on the inside. To give you an idea of what's going on inside a complex scope like a duodenoscope, our graphics guy made this cutaway so you can take a peek inside, where the control handle and insertion tube house channels for air, water, instruments, and the elevator wire. If you're a sterile processing or endotech, you have to make sure to get all of these channels and ports clean before you try to sterilize or disinfect the scope. So now let's take a look inside the main biopsy port and channel of a new colonoscope. We'll pick up our boroscope and take a photo right outside the rim of the biopsy port. And this is what that port looks like as you begin to move inside. And this is the bifurcation, which is the area where the biopsy channel meets up with the other channels. And this is the beginning of the channel inside the insertion tube. Do you see that fuzzy stuff in the upper right hand side? That's probably a little bit of manufacturing debris, which we commonly find inside new endoscopes, which reinforces the need to reprocess every new endoscope before it gets used on patients. Interior components can also look different depending on the type of scope. So let's compare the instrument channel of a colonoscope to a bronchoscope channel, and a gastroscope channel, and you can see that they're super different. It's important to know what a new, intact, and clean channel looks like for each of the scopes that you have in your fleet, 
so that you can identify when there's a problem. Now let's look at the outside of some non-GI scopes. This is a ureteroscope used for procedures in the bladder and kidneys. It has a light guide prong and an electrical paddle connector that plug into the tower and connect to the control handle. That lets the endoscopist control the bending section and use suction or flush with water with a similar instrument port to what we saw on that GI scope. The insertion tube of a ureteroscope is really tiny, just a fraction of the size of a colonoscope. And that's because it needs to be small enough to be threaded into the bladder through the natural orifice down there, where tiny is a good thing, and then pass through the kidney tube and into the kidney to help urologists remove stones or treat other kidney diseases. Ureteroscopes also have a bending section and a distal end, just like other scopes. They're just extremely tiny. And here's the control handle of an older ureteroscope model. This one has an eyepiece and a focus knob for direct visualization by putting it right up against your face. And here's the control handle of a bronchoscope, which is much simpler than a GI scope, but it does have some of the same components. In this picture, you can also see the dial that allows the doctor to control the stiffness of the scope. Now let's take a peek at some distal ends. The complexity of distal ends reflects the complexity of the scope, and ureteroscopes, cystoscopes, and bronchoscopes have fewer components, while colonoscopes and other GI scopes tend to be more complicated. Some scopes look a little bit different. EBIS and EUS scopes have ultrasound tips on the ends, and some scopes like EUS and ERCP scopes have elevator channels. Each scope type and model is different, but they have a lot of the same components. So let's look closer at the distal ends of two urology scopes. On the left is a ureteroscope, which is commonly used to remove kidney stones and treat other kidney diseases. And on the right is a cystoscope used for procedures in the bladder. Both scopes are pretty simple and have light sources here, instrument channels, and camera lenses, which are also sometimes called objective lenses. The distal end of a bronchoscope here is similar to the cystoscope that we saw on the last slide. And as you can see, the colonoscope is larger and more complex. But both types of scopes have light sources, and note that the colonoscope has a third one right here, as well as instrument channels and camera lenses. The colonoscope also has a water jet that shoots water across the lens during procedures to clean it off so that the doctor can see what they're doing. And it also has an auxiliary water channel that allows the operator to pump more water through the scope. So here's a closer look at the distal end of a new colonoscope. It has a few fibers and little pieces of styrofoam on it from the shipping container. And here's a different angle on the outlet of that water jet channel, which flushes water across the lens. Once you know how that water jet outlet should look, you'll be able to tell if there's still soil or debris in it after you clean it. Some endoscopes have ultrasound mechanisms on their distal ends. The EBIS, or endobronchial ultrasound, is used in the lungs, and the EUS, or endoscopic ultrasound, is used in the upper GI tract to provide real-time imaging and assist with aspirations and biopsies. Let's look at the EBIS scope first. The pink part on the distal end is the ultrasound component. And like other scopes we've seen, this one has a light source, a lens, and an instrument channel. Now, when we look at a radial array EUS scope, it also has an ultrasound component on the distal end. And if you look closely, you can see a light source, a camera lens, and an instrument channel. And this one also has a water jet that flushes water across the channel to clean it off. If you're paying close attention, you might have noticed that both of these scopes have grooves along the edge of the ultrasound component. During procedures, a tiny little balloon is actually placed over the ultrasound and filled with water to help conduct ultrasound waves from the scope to the patient tissue. And as you might imagine, it can be really tough to get all of these grooves and tiny little channel outlets clean. And one goal of visual inspection is to make sure that all the blood and soil has been removed before sending the scope for disinfection or sterilization. Here's another common type of EUS scope called a linear array EUS. This one also has an ultrasound component on the distal end, but on this one it's black instead of pink. And it has a camera lens, a light source, and a water jet outlet, just like other scopes we've seen. 
It also has an instrument channel, but this looks a little different from the other scopes we've seen. It has an elevator mechanism that's used to manipulate instruments that come out of the channel so that they can go sideways out of the scope instead of straight out the distal end like most other scopes. Elevator mechanisms on EUS and ERCP scopes have a tiny little wire that the endoscopist can activate to move the elevator up and down. And speaking of ERCP scopes, let's take a closer look at a duodenoscope. It has a light source, a lens, and an air water nozzle, just like other GI scopes. Notice how the lens and light source are side facing rather than on the tip of the scope. That lets the endoscopist see the bile ducts and other structures embedded in the wall of the GI tract. There's also an instrument channel here just out of view and an elevator mechanism that's activated by a wire to direct instruments exactly where they're needed. Now, newer duodenoscope models have a closed elevator channel, but we like to show photos and videos of older models so that you can see what that wire looks like. This little video will show you how the wire pulls the elevator up and down. The important thing to realize is that blood, tissue, and other soil can get under the elevator, and it's extremely important to get that area clean. And that's where visual inspection with lighted magnification is essential because you can't really see down under that elevator using just your naked eye. And that brings us to the end of this video. Here are some key takeaways from what we talked about. Guidelines recommend visually inspecting endoscopes to prevent damaged or contaminated scopes from being used on patients. And knowing basic endoscope components is essential to effectively inspecting them. General components are the same across different types of endoscopes, but every type and model is different. So get familiar with the scopes that you have in your fleet so you know what to expect when you're performing visual inspection. If you want to learn more about endoscope anatomy and visual inspection, you can check out our other YouTube videos on visual inspection tools and common defects, or our one hour CE webinar on the website link in the video description. Thanks for joining me today. For more information, visit our website or contact us by email at education at ofsteadinsights.com. This webinar was made possible by an educational grant from Healthmark, who provided the magnification systems and boroscopes that we use to conduct visual inspections. Please contact Healthmark directly for further information about their systems for visual inspection at www.hmark.com. We would also like to thank Endoscopy Repair Specialist, Inc., which provided technical advice related to visual inspection and endoscope anatomy. Here's a list of disclaimers that you should review before making any changes to device processing or visual inspection practices at your facility.